bless the name of the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Wednesday. And Wednesday means that we are meeting to study the Word of God. Amen. And so if you're logging in, thank you for taking the time out. Listen, this is important stuff. Uh, you're here because you have a desire and a heart to receive from God. Amen? If you just happen to turn to this channel, uh, it was still a, a part of God's plan, and so uh, he's got good things in store for you. Amen? I'm excited about our discussion tonight because it is so foundational, and it is absolutely something that the church really needs, the world really needs the foundation of our faith to be established, to be fortified, to be rooted, and not just rooted, but roots that are deep. Amen? And so we are going to be talking, are you serving God? And that is really about our life as believers. You know, many years ago uh, in my secular career, I worked with security agents. I worked with those who were uh, tasked with protecting assets, organization, buildings, etc. And so uh, part of my responsibility was attending conferences and traveling. And uh, I remember one conference that I went to, one of the keynote speakers shared about his experience and he talked about being a criminal at one point in his life. A criminal who utilized all of the training and the techniques that we were constantly being taught and walking and learning industry standards, relevant standards for the day that we were complying with and uh, it really opened my eyes because he said that it is one thing to know the information it is one thing to learn the information it's one thing to have the information but it's a very different situation in terms of applying and safeguarding that information what do you do with that information? How do you apply that information? Are you on a track that is with integrity and intent towards good, or is the track and the intent negative? And so that really, I, I left that conference with that mindset that, my goodness, in spite of the technology and the resources that you and I are deploying in our organizations, in our homes, in our very lives, there are people who have this information, who knows this information, who has been a part of the inside of this information, uh, and uh, they can go rogue at any moment. They can be negative. And when they're negative, they're negative with a an absolute amount of resource and information. Think about that. And so, in, in actuality, you step back and you think, my goodness, are we really safe? <laughs> are we really safe? Uh, we, we, we understand that for the most part, the majority of individuals who are in certain trades and occupations are doing so from a place where their hearts are committed to that, but it's not always the same. And so I wanted to sh talk about our foundation as believers because, you know, when you look at the life of the believers, it's really the same. And uh, we don't have to look far, point far, pull references from history. We can look at what is happening today in our lives, in our environment, in our society, in our world, in our country. And we can see glaring examples of what I shared. People who operate with a knowledge 
detailed knowledge, background of the Word of God. They've been in church. They grew up in church. They know all of the churchy phrases. They know all the churchy moves. I mean, you see them coming. They look like a church, walk like a church, sound like a church. I mean, they've got it locked and loaded. And uh, unless you are walking in the Spirit of God, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it completely. You're going to attribute them to being righteous when in actuality they're far from it. Their hearts have never surrendered to serving God. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight because it's relevant. But before we continue, I want to pray. And, and I just felt, feel in my spirit to pray for someone watching first before we even get into the discussion repentance to come back to the throne room I think as and then as we go through this lesson today this discussion it's gonna make sense you're gonna it's gonna resonate in your spirit but I want to pray with you before we even start and for you to repeat after me says Lord Jesus forgive me of sins Forgive me of trying to understand it in its entirety instead of simply trusting you. Forgive me of sin. Forgive me of doing things that grieve you, that bring pain to your heart, God. And may this day be a day of transformation as I pursue you and righteousness. Not being perfect, but pursuing the perfect one. Father, I pray that you give them strength, that your word be revealed to them, that your spirit rest in and around and over them, guiding and leading them in all truth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I know that Wednesday night in the Word and, and outside of Sunday morning, any type of Bible study, any time of getting together during the week is intent, intense. What am, I, what am I saying? The enemy hates that. Several weeks ago, I couldn't sleep. I was really not able to fall asleep, and, and I felt in my spirit... It was just time to get up and just quiet my spirit and, and go into prayer, which I did. And uh, Later on in the morning, just before I fell asleep now, for real, I said, God, usually you, you speak to me and let me know what is happening. You show me things, you open my eyes, you give me revelation. Uh, but this particular night, it was just to be in a place of meditation and consecration but I still there was something in me I still wanted an answer and so I said before I even dozed off God I need something and you know I dozed off in that early morning and it wasn't long that it's like someone just shook me and I heard the words echo in stay awake and sober the enemy hates you Stay awake and sober. The enemy hates you. And that wasn't just a word for me. In, in that moment, I felt it was a word for the body of Christ because I stand as a representative of, of Christ and saints. If you're walking in righteousness, you are an ambassador and a representative as well. And so... I took that word to heart because it's really serious about what we're facing as believers through this walk. This isn't to scare anyone. And I'm saying that on, on, on Wednesdays when we meet, I feel spiritual attacks. I sense it. It is greater, you, this would surprise you, it is greater than on Sunday when I'm getting ready to bring a word. And I know it's because the enemy wants to shut everything down 
in our lives, in our society, in our culture that resonates Jesus, resonates Jesus, that promotes the gospel, that points to God. And listen, the gospel isn't going to be brought back by force. It's not going to be brought back by my man mandates and laws and regulation. That's not the gospel. After all, you're not addressing the heart. You're addressing it topically from the surface. You're not doing much there. You ever heard the saying, you can you take somebody out of the hood, but you can't take the hood out of them. <laughs> and that's how it is with sin and sin nature. You know, tr true transformation in Christ happens from the inside out. And it doesn't matter how we dress up the outside, create laws, all of those things does not define righteousness. And we can have an entire place that is riddled in religious norms and standards, just like the Pharisees, and we're still all going to be ushering ourselves to hell. And so I want us to look at Matthew chapter 19, reading from verses 16 through 22. This was an interesting uh, exchange with Jesus and a young ruler. As Jesus is in Judea, it's a region beyond Jordan. And it is a part of Jesus' life where he is crisscrossing the region and he is teaching and preaching and demonstrating the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you can imagine, he's running into people that are really opposed to this new message. I mean, many are being converted, many are following him and, and, and loving what they're hearing, their hearts are being transformed, but there are many who are rejecting this message, including many of the religious leaders. And so here's, beginning at verse 16, it says, Now behold, one came and said to him, this is talking about the young, rich ruler, emphasis, Good teacher, what good thing shall I, shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, to him which one? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness. Honor your father, your mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the young ruler is like, well, good, I checked all those boxes. Woohoo! Blocked, and I'm going to heaven. <laughs> but here's Jesus' reply in verse 21. Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's read that again in 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. In other words, the conversation ended right there. Because in that moment, Jesus, you're trying to take what I worked hard for. I built this over my lifetime. And uh, you're saying that if I'm going to truly seek you, I've got I've to get rid of these things. And so, in a nutshell, that's what he did. He walked away. When we read this passage of scripture, it is not for you to take away that Jesus is somehow opposing success and wealth and living in a beautiful life. In fact... That narrative is not of God. That's false. God wants us to walk in life and abundance. He wants us to walk in strength and peace and sound mind. He wants that for us. That's his desire for us. God the Father has made it clear that he wants to be priority in our lives. That's what he's demonstrating in that exchange. The priority 
is the key. Anything that is priority to you will get your time, your resources, your energy, your commitment. Anything. It's that simple. If it's important, automatically you find the time. <laughs> you, you don't just make an excuse and, you know, well, whatever, whenever. You make the time. We, we get up and we go to our jobs when we're feeling a little under the weather, if it's raining, if it's snowing, if it's hot and sunny, we're still getting up and we're heading out the door and we're going to that job and we're putting in our eight, 10, 12 hours or, or more or less. And the intent is because we have prioritized that job so that we can have income so that we can take care of things we need to with money. It's an entire process that we have prioritized. And so anything that is of importance or priority gets your time, your energy, even your resources. My question is what are we pursuing? What are we prioritizing when we call ourselves Christians? And I talked about the example of the security, technology, information that I was privy to in my secular life. <laughs> and how some of that information was used negatively. It was used in the wrong way. We had individuals that took that information and they did wrong with it. They did bad. <laughs> And so for us who are in Christ and who have been given the gospel and the word of God and it's in us and, and not utilizing it and making it a priority in our heart, that's a problem because if it's a priority in our heart, it really guides, like I said on Sunday, our attitude, our action, our words, our thoughts. It really guides those things. And so it saddens me when I look at the world today and I look at elements of the church and I see and hear religion, but I don't see and hear the righteousness of God. For the righteousness of God provokes people to good works. Let me repeat that. The righteousness of God should provoke people to good works. It should provoke people into conviction. It should provoke people to see in themselves and desiring a radical shift or running from it. But if your religion is simply one that is just creating conflict in every environment that you step into, then it's time to pull back and to begin to wonder what's going on here. And when we look at Christianity in our very great nation and we see how there isn't really growth. Churches are getting bigger, but the righteousness of God seems to be struggling to be maintained. I know this is, this is an indicting word and it's, and it's really hard, but I've been saying from the beginning that, you know, one of my focus was I don't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. <laughs> and when I became a Christian, I said, you know, I want to serve God with an energy and a focus that is radical in Christ. And even more now as a pastor, I want to be a man that promotes the gospel of Jesus Christ and let people know that, listen, this is bigger than what we see. What you're seeing here standing, me, this flesh, it happens to be that I'm African American, you know, Guyanese descent, with a slight accent. <laughs> but really that's not me because the, the true Paul Ross is a spirit being. 
And that's you, that's the people in your room, that's the people that we in, interact with every day as we go about the true identity of every single person that we're moving around is spirit. That's the only true form and it is the eternal state. For one day this will perish and it will return to the earth and the ground from whence it came deteriorate and to be put away and forgotten about but the eternal state of man continues and that's why the scriptures continually emphasizes the importance of us living a life with an eternal perspective and so it saddens me as I see the state of the church today people claiming to be Christians we go to church we even participate in church activities but our heart truly are not sold out to God. I read pure in heart. The truth will always surface when the heart speaks. And uh, when we look at a couple of examples in recent years, COVID. <laughs> Think about COVID. Think about politics. Think about race relations. All of these things test humanity's hearts. And even more importantly, they test and determine believers' conditions. And it should be a reason for us to pause and understand, man, this is serious. One day, you're going to be standing face to face with the Almighty God. It's going to be Him and you. Your neighbor, who is a Republican, would not be standing by you. Your other neighbor, who is a Democrat, will not be standing by you. Your, your, your affiliations will not be defending you. Whether it's conservative, conservative state or liberal state, none of it will defend you in that moment. For Christ himself will look at you through the lens of righteousness. And righteousness, the Bible says, exalts a nation and sin brings a reproach to its people. It's destructive. It crumbles it. And as a pastor, I realize that in this day and age, I have got to break free from those chains that are holding me to say, listen, you have got to comply with talking points to sound religious and to comply and to run a track or a trend that seems to comply with this. When in actuality, as a man of God, my mandate and my instructions has been and will continue to be to proclaim the good news of Jesus. For when we stand before him, we cannot point fingers at anyone and all we can do is stand and give an account of our life of our actions of our words of our deeds before God Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 it says keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring what the issues of life it, it's, it's a revealer. It is an exposure. It is a pulling away and revealing. I've shared a couple of weeks ago how one of the most devastating experiences that I've had was, you know, a couple of years ago when a gentleman that I went to Bible study with, we met for lunch, we talked Bible, and, and I would always talk about the goodness of God and what God is doing and what I long to see. And he sounded like he was on track and everything was flowing and we were in unity, so it seemed. And then one day we had an election. President Barack Obama is elected. And, he, and that gentleman walked into my office and I'm sitting behind the desk. And, and I says, how are you doing, brother? And he, with venom, and anger and not having a conversation with me for that 
for, for that morning, this is our first encounter of the day, that gentleman walked over to my desk, slammed his fist and pointed my face and says, it's idiots like you that's got that so-and-so in the White House. And it shocked me. I sat back in my chair. I was trying to make light of it. I says, brother, take it easy. Take it easy. Realize that God is still in control. And he used some more profanities and he left the office. It broke my heart. It made me sad, sad. And, and I, I sat there really for a few long moments just weighing what just happened. Weighing what just happened. It was a revealing of his heart that all along he was masquerading the righteousness of God. Because that election should not change the righteousness of God in him, in me, in you. But my friends, it was the revealing that had begun. And then, as if that wasn't enough, over the years we've been seeing this really revealing occurring in the body of Christ, exposing the true righteousness of God. It saddens me because, listen, I know that God will return one day. He says it in his word. I know without the question of a doubt that I will stand before him. I know that you will stand before him. I know that we will give an account of our lives. So why aren't we pursuing the righteousness of God? Allowing the love of God to continually filtrate and filter the mess and the junk out of us, away from us. The light of God. I spoke about this on Sunday and encourage you to go back and look at that message. I don't have time anymore and energy to waste chasing these things because lives literally are being sucked into eternity. That's why I felt compelled at the top of this uh, we're meeting to pray because I just felt in my spirit, someone, someone, someone needs to know that Jesus Christ is the answer for the world today. And if the body of Christ gets its duck in a row, things are going to begin to fall back into place. Righteousness will continue to be reestablished. I'm pleading with you, if you're a man or a woman of God, to break down those altars, destroy them, pull them down, pull down those idols, pull down those things that have been constructed and be, being worshipped right now. Pull them down, pull them down. Let's return to God. Let's return to God. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, it says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he, not the top, not the appearance, not the involvement, not your activities, not the size of your congregation, not your involvement in the community. Those things are peripheral. Those things are attributes to a degree. But as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. Listen to that. That's what I experienced. And you know, the Bible references Christ's sorrow and pain many times as he interacted with, with the crowd and the disciples and, the, and the, the people who were around him and many of his exchange and conversation 
there was a, a little phrase in a lot of those passages of scripture that, that made me realize, my goodness, this is serious. It says, and he knew their thoughts. You can imagine Christ having a conversation. He's in a room, he's interacting with people, and he's seeing that in, in, in many aspects, what's coming out of their mouth sounds good, looks good, their action, it looks, it looks good to the unlearned, the untrained, the undiscerning person. But the truth is he was seeing something that was contrary to the righteousness of God. And I've got a responsibility to say, man, we have got to, we've got to put away the religiousness. Just get rid of it. I'm just tired of the religiousness. I wouldn't be here in this role as a man of God, as a pastor, but I feel God has appointed me for such a time as this, to speak the truth to a generation that is drifting pastors, leaders in the church, church members, that one day the Trump will sound, not Donald Trump, but the trumpet of the living God will sound and it says, those in Christ will be caught up. And I don't want to be one, and you don't want to be one either, that is left standing there after the rapture, after God calls his people home, and you're thinking, but I was, uh, I thought I was uh, righteous. I thought I was, I thought I was doing it right. The heart reveals the truth every single time, every single time. And, and certain situations brings it to the surface, normally the fire. That's why with precious metals, they ran through fire. When you see precious metals in their natural state, they look bad, they look dirty, they're, you know, for the untrained eyes, they're just trash. But for the trained eyes, they can pick up and say, wow, this is a good one. That's a good one. And then they run them through the fire. The fire then reveals its authenticity. The fire reveals its purity. The fire reveals its true nature. For in that moment, what is attached to it that is false and sandy and unimportant falls off. And what is left, it's its purity and its state. If it's a false piece that's been identified and thrown in the fire, all of it is consumed. So it may have passed the test by the visual. Somehow, somewhere along the line, that individual may have picked up the wrong piece says, wow, this sure looks like a big one. This looks like a good one. It's past that visual test. But here's the real test. Now we run it through the fire. You know, in 1 Kings chapter 3, there's a pretty interesting story. And Solomon is known as one of the wisest, wisest men that ever lived, blessed with knowledge and wisdom from God. And... And as a judge in the land as well, he had a predicament where two women sharing the same home had babies moments apart. And the story goes on to say that, you know, during the night, one woman accidentally rolled on her infant child and killed them. It happens. She is overwhelmed with grief and, and she wants her baby, but her baby's now dead, so she quietly sneaks in to the room of the other mother, steals her baby, replaces it with the dead baby. 
Well, the Bible story goes on that later that morning when the mother wakes, she realizes that she checks the baby and the first thing is, this is not my child. And of course, this entire situation ends up in the courts of Solomon who will decide the matter. He's going to decide it. <laughs> Solomon, after hearing the back and forth, he turns to his soldiers and he says, bring me a sword. <laughs> Just bring me a sword. He's, he's not having a conversation with the women anymore. <laughs> he, he has heard enough. And he turns to the soldier and he says, do me a favor and cut this baby in half. All right. And then they each could have a half. One lady screamed out, yeah, and then we, none of us, I'm not going to get any and you're not going to get any. But the other lady just cried out, stop, no. Just let her have the child. Just let her, do not take the child's life. Just let her have the child. And Solomon in that moment says, give her the baby. For her heart revealed the truth. The other mother who was willing to sacrifice that child and have it killed so that her selfish ambitions would be satisfied revealed her heart as well. And that's what we're seeing in our world today. That's what we're seeing in our churches today. Where pastors and church folks are being blinded because they've allowed their hearts to be contaminated and they're unable to see the truth revealed in the Word of God. Now there are dozens and dozens of resources and YouTube and Instagram and online of information bombarding people, telling you how you should think and what you should think and everybody is running off of that, but no one wants to take the time to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and see what it reveals to us through the spirit of God being poured into our lives. It's sad. It's sad. I am making... A declaration to the generation to abandon the altars that have been constructed in our lives. Abandon them, pull them down, kick them, kick them down. Tear them down, repent, tear them down. Pastors not fellowship in with pastors because of foolish and idiotic doctrinal differences. Pull them down. Tear them down. Members of churches getting into back and forth with each other. Not understanding that if their eyes were really revealed and open, they would see the demonic forces that has been assembled against them to destroy them all. You think you're free and clear of the attacks and the devouring and the destruction of the enemy? No, my friend. The Bible says his goals and his plans are singular, to steal, to kill, to destroy. There is no other plans built into that. And until we see that, we fall prey, we fall victim to being a part and a tool in the enemy's hands to go after others and to destroy and to pull down others. The security plans I shared at the top of the hour. 
What are we doing with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we on a track that pursues the righteousness of God? Are, are we on a track that has been taken over by the God of this world, Satan? I know this is a tough one. Value will lead your priorities and your priority follows your heart. And when we look at Luke 6, 45, it says, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth what? Good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. In that moment, when that gentleman walked into my office and, and, and hurled accusations at me in anger and, and venom, it was his heart revealing the truth. And when we look at what is happening in our country today, man, my goodness, if, if this isn't a heart revealing that is occurring, I don't know what else is. I don't know what else it'll take for the body of Christ to be awakened, to be sh shook uh, awake. I don't know what else. What, what else needs to happen for the people of God to refocus back to the righteousness of God? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, it's, it tells us some really serious things. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We, that shouldn't be us. But we have renounced, what? The hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of what? The truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, listen to this, it is veiled to those who are perishing, their people being destroyed, whose minds the gods of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, Paul is saying, but Christ Jesus the Lord and our ourselves, your bond servant for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It is that boldness and that authority that we saw. It is why Stephen could stand in the midst of angry people with rocks ready to crucify and hurl it at him and still lift his eyes up to God in praise, in worship, and in mercy. He says, listen, don't hold a charge against them. I see the bigger picture. But the enemy doesn't want you to see the big picture. He wants you to, to chase after the rabbits, chase after these things. It saddens me when I see people out there running around. Look at our government, look at our politics, how divisive and nasty it has gotten. And people who are claiming to be the righteousness of God are some that are demonstrating and exhibiting some of the most nasty behavior. And they're identifying with the one who came and died for me. And we call ourselves the righteousness of God. And we say that our mandate is to go into the, all of the world and to proclaim the good news to all. We say that. But is that what we are seeing? Is that what we're doing? Or have we become the modern day Pharisees? 
The Bible says that, listen, unless our righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, and this was words directly from Christ. It wasn't the apostles. It wasn't one of the priests. It was the high priest, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the redeemer, who said, listen, you guys are missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. You're ushering yourself in to hell and you're keeping others out of heaven. This is the word that God is saying to the masses, primarily to the body of Christ. My friends, Christ is coming back soon. And he wants people that are going to be on fire for him and leading others to him. We've got to lead others to Jesus Christ. In James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, listen to what it says here. This is a sobering word tonight, isn't it? It's a sobering word. It says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and co covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask a misc with ill intent, not out of purity, that you may spend it on what? Your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He makes yourself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Is that a mistake? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We've got to humble ourselves. We've got to return to God. We've got to cry out to him. We've got to repent. We've got to really get back to the basics. When you look at dynamic populations and empires over histories gone that were doing well, they all crumbled and are now just in the history book. And one of the reasons is they got to a place where they thought that they were big and bad enough. They didn't need anyone. They don't need God. They don't need whoever. They can do it on their own. And today, we simply read of them in the history books as a distant memory. And my warning is that's where we're going as a nation if we continue to drive through all of the stop signs. If we continue to drive through all of those red lights, if we continue to laugh and jeer at pastors like myself that brings a word in a season and a time like this that is from the throne that is saying, stop, wake up, dust yourself off and get back on track, that's where we're going. I have ran from this for many years because from an early stage I understood the significance and the importance of serving God. That it shouldn't be a game and it shouldn't be just playing around and it shouldn't be just to impress and it shouldn't be just for monetary gains. It must be a heart issue. It must be a heart condition. He 
told the disciples, if I be lifted up. This was just before he ascended back to heaven in his physical form to assume the glorious transformative power of Jesus. He told them, listen, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto you. And that was a symbolic moment, a symbolic uh, utterance to the disciples that, listen, you must keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. You're going to see false religion. You're going to see false God. You're going to see false Christianity. And Paul even said, listen, if anyone comes and preach a message that is different from this, they may use language that sounds like this, but if it's not this, it's of the devil. I don't care how it's packaged and how it looks and how it sounds and feels. If it's not here, it is of the devil. You may say, Pastor, but he, she's so nice. He is so nice. If it's not here, it's of the devil. And the Bible says he masquerades as an angel of light. So it is that time for us to be awakened and to understand that God's plans for us in Jeremiah 29 and 11 are good, with good hope, good future, and ex an acceptable end. Not to destroy us, not to pull us down, not to throw us in the dirt, but the key is we've got to trust in him. We've got to pursue him. As he said in that same passage, passage of scripture in verse 13, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. So let's pray. This was a, a heavy word, but a relevant word and a timely word. I want you to share this. I want you to get it into people's face because this is a prophetic word to the church tonight. And if you're an unbeliever and you're watching, God has plans for you. He loves you more than you can realize. And when you look around at the world and you see the mess that's happening, God is still the answer. He is still on the throne. And his mercy and his love for you transforms that. It transforms your environment. And it gives you a peace in the midst of chaos, hope in the midst of hopelessness, strength in your weakness. That's what he promises. And so I prayed at the beginning that you accept Christ, that you invite him into your life. You're not going to see perfection overnight. You're not going to see perfection in this instant. But what you will experience is a newness of mind that pursues the perfection of Christ. Father, we worship you and we magnify your name. I thank you and I pray over every ear and heart that was listening to this word tonight. God, I pray that there be a conviction not to destroy, but to draw back to you. Draw back to you. The song says, draw me close to you. Never let me go. Never let me go. And I pray that our hearts be returned to you, God, that we begin to see sinners as those that need salvation, not to attack them, not to be vile and antagonistic towards them, but to see them as men and women that needs a savior and to walk in the light and the love of God, to be light in darkness, to be salt in an unsavory world, and to fulfill the great commission to see lives change for the glory of God. Father, I pray against backlash and I pray against attacks and I pray against those that are even watching and plotting and scheming. In the name of Jesus, the word of God says that greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. And there is no weapon that's formed against us that will prosper. And we stand on the authority of God. And I lay hold the plans and the promises of God. 
and fortify ourselves and I fortify our homes with the blood of Jesus. Father, that as we walk and we talk and we go through this valley of the shadow of death, we'll fear no evil. For we know that you are with us. And so I pray over homes tonight that we stand guard with our hearts anchored in the blood of Jesus. Father, continue to show yourself strong and mighty. The word that I feel in my spirit, he's saying, listen, don't get anxious for anything, but find hope in Jesus Christ, for I will show myself strong. I am showing myself strong. Watch me. Watch me. Keep your eyes on me, and I will show you great and mighty things. But first, we've got to get back to that place of serving him with a passion, with our hearts yearning for him. Listen, on Sunday, I'm going to continue some of this. It's going to be a different message, but a very similar message. And the reason that I am on this is because I feel in my spirit I'm prompted, I'm pushed in this direction. Like I said a couple of weeks ago, every time I try to steer away and bring you just a nice cushiony message that says, listen, you were born for success. <laughs> God stares me back to a word that says, I want my people's hearts. I want my people's hearts. It's been, it's been fast eroding. And the things of this world has been fast encroaching it and overwhelming it. When that happens, it blocks our vision of Jesus. Listen, I love you, and that's why I'm sharing this with you. But I can tell you what, God loves you more. The love of God, the agape love of God, runs circle around any love that I or any woman or man of God can walk in. He is the ultimate lover of our souls. And his plan is that no one perishes, but everyone comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen? If you're in Lima area, I would love to see you in person. It is so much better, a better experience when we can be here in person and interact with each other and find strength and support and hope shared the bible says listen don't forsake the assembling of uh, of each other as some do that's detrimental it isolates and destroys but if you can be here in person we welcome you we are at 3075 yokum road right here in lima ohio we meet on sunday morning at 10 15 and at that same time we also go live on facebook so if for some reason you can't make it, we want you to join us online. And tell somebody about, about the goodness of God. Have someone log in with you. Have someone accompany you to church. Listen, you, tell them you've got a crazy pastor that is not just a pastor who wants to look good, be impressive, and, you know, uh, he's done with that. He's just a man on fire for God. And the Bible says, listen, if you light yourself on fire, you know, the saying is, uh, if a man or a woman lights themselves on fire, people are going to come from miles to see them burn. So I am lighting myself on fire, the fire of God, uh, without excuses, without apologies. I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God bless you. May you run the race with vitality and vigor. May you be bold to proclaim the good news of Jesus and stand on the authority of God in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Shalom.